start by announcing that the meeting is being recorded auditorily and visually. Um, uh, first on the agenda is public comment period. We have a number of people from the public. Wonderful. Anybody want to make comments? Sharon. Sharon Moulton. Uh, I'm, um, I'm Sharon Moulton from Elise's Ward. And I want to say, I want to make sure, because we've been talking about buildings and building codes and whatever, I want to make sure that everybody knows about the Better Buildings Workshop that's going to be a week from Saturday um, at, at, the, um, at the Hitchcock Center for the Environment from 1 to 3. And the person who used to be here, Darren, who talked last time, mm -hmm. he's going to be one of the speakers. And Quinton Zonderman um, from, I don't know if he's still with CABA, but he was one of the CABA leaders, the, the climate something or other, Climate Activist Business Association. And um, Joe Comerford. Thank you. So, What's the talk called? It's called Better Buildings Workshop. Doesn't sound technical, hands on. No, I policy. Think no, but I'm pretty sure what it is. It's the. Whereas we've been doing a lot of talking about improving the IUCC uh, code, you know, how municipalities can do that. This is kind of geared towards activists, how activists can be involved in this. That's what I've heard. Does that fit your? I, I guess. I, mm -hmm. I just was told, make sure that you publicize this, and I thought one way to publicize it yep. was to mention it here. And you can, uh, you, you can go, go online and, you know, you have a choice. You can sign up for free, or you could sign up with a donation. <laughs> you know, it's free to the public, but they also let you say, well, I'm going to give you a donation right when you sign up. Um, I've gotten emails on it. I will forward them out to the energy commission just as soon as any further details. Okay. Uh, no other comments? Yeah. Well, I could. Okay. Um, yeah. I came here just because I you thought y'all would be a friendly group. Introduce yourself. Um, I'm Jackie Balance from Florence. Okay. Um, and I've been working with uh, Climate Action Now subgroup organizing a Green New Deal Earth Day Forum which you can take one and pass it on. Some of you already got it. And I just thought I would share this with this committee because as individuals, I suspect you are concerned with sustainability. And that's a big issue facing the globe right now. So if you all would like to come to our event, we'd love to have you, if you have some, from your area of expertise, you can think of some good questions to ask on Earth Day. We'd love to have them. Thank you. Further. I don't have to go up. My name is Joyce Rosenfeld, and I'm working with Jackie on the Green New Deal Forum. And uh, we're very excited with the, uh, I'm wearing these sunglasses because of that glare. Um, we're very excited uh, with all the community response and um, energy. And um, so we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd. Good. Love the work you're doing. We're also, uh, part of this is to work with the Downtown Association to um, engage merchants and businesses, perhaps for the first annual Northampton Green New Business as Usual Earth Day celebration. So uh, we're meeting with the Downtown Association <coughs> at their next meeting. and. Um, I just came to introduce myself. My name is Gordon Meadows. I'm a Northampton resident, actually a high school classmate of Aiden's. Uh, I do business development for an energy service company based in Amherst, where we develop large federal energy conservation projects. Uh, and I am interested in joining you guys. And I wanted to see oh. if there might be a spot. Okay. Um, uh, if you go online, you can find an application form. If you're, I'm Chris Mason, the energy officer. If you can find my email, I can move to you after this. Okay, great. Make sure you get a form. First thing to do is put an application in to the mayor's office. Okay. Yeah, we don't have an opening at the moment, but you can't hurt to get your name in there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah.
Um, so no one else is going <laughs> to. So I will move to approve the minutes of January 10th, um, uh, 2018. Second. Uh, 2019. Sorry. Now the agenda. Now Lisa seconded. Uh, actually, come. You, Lisa moved. I'll second. And second. I can't move. Right. Um, and for discussion, uh, I'll say that Louis sent me comments um, uh, stating the, a few corrections. Um, one stated that passive house, it, it, where we had in there, passive house is an alternative compliance path. Um, he says passive house will become an alternative compliance path for the state energy code starting with the 2018 IECC and going forward. So that change. And then where the notes said that. Uh, said basically we said are we saying that we should push BBRS to adopt passive house features as a stretch code and Louis would add in passive house modeling has been part of the mass code since August 2016 as an alternative performance path Northampton hasn't seen a passive house design thus far so those additions um, uh, I would um, a friendly amendment to uh, the motion to approve the minutes with those um, uh, edits to it I guess the formal way of doing that. Lisa, you have to accept that friendly amendments. <laughs> um, I second the amendment. Uh, I, I actually, I can't move a motion because I'm not a member. Move the, I move to amend the minutes as uh, Chris stated. Very good. Thanks. Second. Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Wayne, anything on climate resiliency and regeneration? No, we're basically in the waiting steps. We had public forums, we had stakeholder groups, we had comments from you guys and the planning board, and we had an online survey, and now it's all in our consultant's hands. My guess is by your next meeting we have a draft, but it might be in the afternoon. So. Okay, soon we'll be discussing a lot, but not yet. Okay, but keep it on the agenda for next? I think so, yeah. I mean, worst case, nothing happens. Right. Right. Meeting, but, yeah, right. but it might, something might happen. Correct, right. Okay. All right. Um, next item, voting on the IECC 2021, uh, basically a status report. Um, I, uh, wait, I don't know if you announced this at the last meeting or not, that the planning department is now um, is signed on as a, um, a government member, which means you can have four voting members. Right? I'm not sure if people knew that. Um, of course, building department is. Um, city council is considering it. We um, we just drafted an order to appropriate one hundred thirty five dollars for the registration fee. We'll pass that hopefully at our next Thursday meeting, <clears throat> and then we'll have to develop another order that actually um, develops a process by which we can come up with how we're going to vote because it would have to be approved by the entire city council. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so that's where we are with it. Okay. Great. Before the end of March. Yes. Yeah. And, and I've been clear for the record that we're happy to vote the right way, but we want somebody else to do research and just give us a script. I don't, I don't want to become an expert in the energy code. So if someone tells me how to vote, we're going to vote for us. I'm hoping, I mean, I'm in my position, I'm going to, going to do my best to try to make sure to put guidance out there to everybody yeah. who needs it. I'm hoping Louie will join me. <laughs> I think between the two of us, we can. And I give you Chris Stegler's email address. So USDN is sort of monitoring this. They're doing a series of webinars that I haven't sent in. I get it's one of the script, but USDN is doing their own right. script. And I think Sierra Club's doing their own script. So there'd be no shortage of people who are researching it. And all the time. Right, right, yes. Yeah, but you know, especially in something like you, we actually know what it means. So we don't have to follow the script if you think it's different things. So we, we, we should probably set up some sort of system so that if there are questions, there are people who you can go to to get the questions answered. Okay. Um, and I, yeah, I'm certainly happy to do that as well as I can. Um. Yeah. I, I will say, this is my one fear, is that there's been so much discussion about this in lots of trade publications that even though I think environmental groups are stepping up, I just have to assume behind the scenes that home builders and people who may go in a different direction are probably doing exactly the same thing. Like we yeah. keep looking at, oh, this should be easy. Like USDN distributed it's like how they could get 20,000 votes and all USDN members joined. But maybe other people do exactly the same thing. Right. They don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 
I mean, on the national level, USDN, NEEP, uh, National Association of State of Energy Officials. I've heard you know, the Energy Efficiency Codes Co Coalition, New Buildings Institute, uh, American Council on Energy Efficient Economy. They're all somehow involved in trying to get people in, this, in different states going. Um, and then uh, climate mayors of the U.S. Council of Mayors, as I hear, are informing mayors. So there's, a, it's, my understanding is Massachusetts is really the strong weight. Yeah, it, it's a heavy weight. We're, we're, we're really doing a lot. Um, but very nicely, others are trying to start to do that on the national level. Is the mayor's office <coughs> also registering separate from the planning office? I am, um, uh, yeah, I spoke with the mayor today about it, and I'm going to give him all the information needed. He probably will I mean, until he looks over in detail, but I'm, it sounded like there wouldn't be any reason why he wouldn't. Chris, is there a cap at some point we don't get more of it? You know, I looked, I actually read the bylaws today, um, and you certainly get an impression, I mean, there's nothing in the bylaws that says how many um, government members can be associated with one municipality. When we, when we looked things up, it, it was my understanding that up to we could have up to 16 votes of so four different entities within the same body, which is the municipality. Of Where so, did you get the 16 votes from? Um, I have to look again, but yeah. <clears throat> when we looked it up, that was my understanding is that there was we would be capped at the um, four Four different departments, four different essentially, departments? with four okay. votes each. Okay. But I could be wrong. Okay. It's a lot to wade through, that stuff. Um, that's worth looking at. Um, uh, you know, I looked I looked at the, their bylaws today without reading them in detail. And I, I mean, once I got into something that looked like it was talking more about uh, the board and stuff, I stopped reading. But maybe there's something in there. Um, and that we should know because um, I also was going to approach the health department and the fire department about it. Um, but, um, yeah, so it's stop where the maximum is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no one need to push too hard. If it, although the fire department and the health department, for their own reasons, might want to be part of this as well. Um, uh, so it might be worth having a conversation. Chris, if you out. find that there <clears throat> is that limit and one of those other departments are interested, I think the city council would be more than happy to step back just yep. because for us it's really complicated right. um, in terms of timing of meetings and you know figuring out the process and getting the votes in place. And then, right. So um, if you could let me know as soon as possible about that, that I would be that. helpful because we can um, pull back our order. You guys can't just empower the council president or Thanks we could potentially, but we have to come up with that process when we Cut. bring it to the agenda. And it just, these things take so much time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, happy to. As I work on that. Um, okay. Um, so the next item we have down here is the feedback needed. And I think the feedback basically is, does the Energy Commission want to actively discuss this topic or do they want to just be kept informed? Ordinance relative to the large-scale ground-mounted solar arrays. Um, Wayne and Elisa, can you, can you kind of give a background on that? Yeah, let me start with the two sort of key background points. The current ordinance was discussed by this committee four years ago, if I'm making up the time period, but some, some number of years ago. And we sort of felt like, PD is a really good thing, but obviously trees are a really good thing, and so we do this balancing act. So up to 25,000 board feet, which obviously depends on how dense the forest stand is, but for the sake of argument, five acres. Um, and it, there is sort of a loophole, it's not actually a legal loophole, but it's our interpretation of the state is not enforcing things. So if you cut over 25,000 board feet, this is where the number came from, you need one of two things. You either need to have approval for a land use that requires those trees to be cut, or you need a forest cutting permit. They couldn't get approval from us. For, they, so there was one test case, the, the PV field is planned at the old mill railroad gravel pit off our main road. So they couldn't get approval from us because we wouldn't allow them to cut more than 25,000 board feet. So they cut all the trees ahead of time. Before, so then they went to the state and said, can we get a forest cutting permit? And the state said no, because you're not cutting for forestry purposes, you're cutting to clear the site for land use, and that requires a local permit. 
So then they said, it's great, we're going to go ahead and cut down the trees anyway. There's no violation of our local rules, so we have no ability to enforce. My read is there's a violation of state law because they didn't get a forest cutting permit. But we, of course, don't enforce state law. And the state's saying, didn't get a forest cutting permit because it's anticipation of development, so therefore we're not going to enforce. I think they're wrong, frankly. I think the state should be enforcing. But we have no tools, and if they're not enforcing, word spreads like wildfire. So if, in fact, this is a loophole, and the loophole may be because of lack of enforcement from the state, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't want to blame the state, but one way or another, they create a loophole. They got around a little bit by they required the seller to cut the trees down rather than the buyer, but nonetheless, the buyer said, we're only buying land if you cut down 105,000 board feet of timber, so the seller did that. Um, so there's sort of a loophole. So that forced us to come back and say, okay, whether it's a legal loophole or not, it's a loophole, how do we address that? At the same, so that, that was sort of one thing that's driving us. The second thing driving it is um, there was a state law passed before people were doing large scale PV, which says photovoltaics are exempt from zoning. You can't prohibit them. You can, you can reasonably regulate them, but you can't prohibit them. We believe, and there's every proof of this, that all the and it's at the same time the state has something exempting PV for property taxes. So if you have PV on your roof, you're not paying property tax. We believe that both of those things were intended for rooftop, and then as these things grew, they started to take advantage of the exemption. The property tax, the PV people believe it's a mistake, and they're in fact all negotiating payment in lieu of agreements with the cities, because even though these are paying more property taxes than they need to, they're locking in 20 years of agreement of property taxes, because their fear is you put together a pro forma, you build this thing, two years later the state changes the law, and suddenly your property tax are enough to make your entire system fail. So that the PV developers are interested in doing this voluntarily. But anyways, the zoning is the same thing. Technically the law says you gotta allow these things, which means you can't do a special permit. Again, we don't think that's the intent of the legislature, but that's the reality. And we have a great city solicitor who thinks we should follow the laws. Um, and so he's saying, well, our zoning is flawed the way it is because it requires a special permit. So you can't say no, and a special permit allows you to say no. So that's sort of the two, so this was driven by part, you know, that our zoning is unquestionable legality. Somebody could challenge it. It's driven in part by this sort of loophole. And it's driven in part by saying, is there a way to expand the uses in some ways, right? So 25,000 board feet was a, a made up number out of nowhere. So the zoning, in essence, does a couple of things. It has a look back provision. So we already have, we have a significant tree ordinance. If you cut down a tree that's over 20 inch uh, deviate diameter breast height and you get a permit, you know, cut down the tree and then you get a permit a year later, it still is if you didn't cut down the tree. And so you need to replace that tree. So the proposed zoning would require a look back for a large scale. So you cut down, in this case, 105,000 board feet. We would require some of those board feet to be replaced, which we don't now, because now it's only proactive. Um, and we require a certain amount of open space that would come with these things. In the theory, that's a way to mitigate it. We, and we require that if you cut down the trees, you cut the roots. And we know that about half the carbon is stored below the soil. Um, and so that was all the idea. So that's, that's the reason in favor of this. The concern, I think, for people who don't like the ordinance is it does say we're allowing PV in places that are currently forced. And there have been some people who haven't gone for it, haven't gone for the polls. Um, you know, and there's also a balancing that, that you have to be carbon neutral, or carbon storage positive, I guess, within 10 years. Because obviously cutting down the trees means your first few years of PV may be worse. But if we're saying it's, it's carbon neutral over, you know, 10 years, these things have expect a lifetime of 10 years. Is <coughs> so that's all the stuff that led into that, that ordinance. Uh, our fears we do nothing again, now with the word out about um, the Ryan Road project, we're going to have the few other people who are looking at it, and this stuff's growing. People keep looking, even with the decline in the SMART program. People are still looking, so we're expecting more. I didn't quite follow how, if we have a city ordinance about not cutting down more than twenty-five thousand board feet, how what they did at Ryan Road was not a violation of that. So it's the state law that says you can't cut down more than twenty-five thousand board feet without a forest cutting permit. Okay. Our law says you can't get a permit. For PV that requires you to cut that more than 25,000 board feet. 
so they cut them all down ahead of time. Uh, and we all we didn't think it was, I mean, we had discussed this at the time, we thought it wasn't a loophole because the state would prevent that from happening. So that's the background. Okay. Um, uh, actually, one fact, I mean, don't we have certain parts of this, uh, Northampton that are simply off limits to PV? Yes. Um, and Alan seems to think we can too. The only exception to saying no to things on the state's object allowed is when there's major health and safety reasons. The main place we don't allow it is the floodplain. Now, we didn't do it more <coughs> because of prime ag soils. We didn't want to lose those soils. But you could also imagine photovoltaic, you know, a lot of stuff that could float away and cause more damage might have health and safety problems. So, Alan, see what the solicitor feels like we're on safe ground because there's a floodplain reason. Okay, that wasn't the reason we did it. We did it from the ag, but it effectively gets us the same. Thing. Right, okay. So you can't just extend that to forested lands throughout the state. Right. Okay. Okay. So the main, um, so, I mean, I was being copied on a number of emails as this was being discussed, and it seemed like between the planning board and the city council, it was being covered pretty well. And, you know, the discussions were deep and thoughtful and kind of followed along with what our intent was. So I wasn't sure the Energy Commission needed to or would want to weigh in on this anymore, but it's really the Energy Commission's purview, so I thought I would bring it here and just kind of get your guys' feedback. Let me see one more thing to you know, sort of what, what the hot issue came with the chambers. So we went before the Tree Commission um, initially, and they, they co-sponsored the basic map. They, they liked that piece. It was then when we went to Alan Seawald for his signature that he said he's not comfortable with a special permit. And so we dropped the special permit, which implies we can say no, we can't, and replace it with site plan approval. And that's the reason Tree Commission asked for it to come back, because they're worried about that change. Um, and again, we don't feel like we have to, you know, Alan tells us we don't have a legal right to require the special permit. But, but that was the change from what we first talked with you, when right. we first talked to the Tree Commission. So what's being implemented is different than what we recommended but not in terms of math, not in terms of formula, just that one thing going from special <coughs> permit to site plan. Right, okay, right. So I was just gonna add, in terms of process, um, we, the City Council um, Committee on Legislative Matters just held this joint hearing with the Planning Board. Um, and we, there was a really good turnout, the Public uh, Shade Tree Committee um, folks, Lily Lombard kind of organized a bunch of climate um, activists to come and talk to their issues. Um, she representing the, um, the Public Shade Tree, Tree Commission <coughs> said that they're no longer willing to support it as amended. Um, and they asked for us to slow the process down, to bring in experts, to um, be able to do uh, more research and really have a clear sense of what the implications of the amended version are. And I think they're meeting tomorrow, uh, Lily and the, the vice chair, Todd Ford, I, I don't know if you know all this yet, but are meeting with uh, Carolyn Mish tomorrow to start to develop a research agenda of what, what they want looked at. Um, and some of the things that came up from the public, not just the Public Shade Tree Commission, as concerns of the hearing on Monday were that the new draft um, raises questions that no one can answer, it weakens our ability to protect trees and forests, 20 years of energy production in exchange for the removal of five acres that can live for hundreds of years seems like a poor trade-off. Um, it would be better off as a community to slow down, zoom out, research the issues, seek the advice of experts. Um, they, People talked about wanting us to look at how other municipalities have grappled with this so that we can learn from their mistakes. Um, and the kind of the biggest issue, I think, was with the interpretation of um, City Solicitor Seawald of the Mass General Law ch uh, Chapter in Section 3. Um, his interpretation of it seems conservative. Um, and people cited the actual DOER's policy guidance for regulating solar energy systems, which um, seems to kind of create a little bit more latitude than what Attorney Seawald is calling for with his amendment. So people want, wanted us to err not so much on the side of protecting the 
the city from being sued essentially as thinking about you know what is this the, the carbon trade-off in mounting solar panels when you're getting rid of so many trees. So in short, there, there's going to be an active group. There is an active. There group. is an active group investigating this. Right. Okay. So since it's been brought up and I'm here, I I mean I don't know that we have like a whole lot to add, but it seems to me that. If imposing a requirement to perform a life cycle analysis rather than kind of doing a pro forma uh, kind of uh, ad hoc life cycle analysis that assumes that all trees are the same and all PV is the same and all land is the same, that each development that wants a permit should do a life cycle analysis that shows that what they're doing, uh, you know, over some time frame that the city thinks is important is carbon negative. Um, that's sure what's in there. Basically, it's just a ten-year time period. Well, so a, a ten-year time period is um, is okay. Um, but the main, the main problem, though, is that what Alan T. Wong is saying is that we cannot deny. So you can come up with any criteria you want to, but at the end, <coughs> we can't say, okay, based on this criteria, you can't build your array. Okay, so so. Cannot deny means like literally there is you nothing the city could ever do. Right. Right. No, no, no. We, we can we can condition it to say in order to do this you need to meet you need to show that you're carbon positive. Oh, you could. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we can't do is bring discretion. So we have to tell them what the rules are up front, and if they do that, they get to do it. If they don't, they have to do a different one. Oh, just okay. uh, my understanding of what Attorney Seawalt was saying was he actually is all about the special permits. He thinks that that it would strengthen it and that it's a good way that the site plan um, alternative is actually more problematic than having a special permit piece. Um, that's, I'm pretty sure about that. So let's see. Um, so that's, I think that's Carolyn's um, interpretation. And he actually, in the meeting, said that's not true, that he thinks that special permits would be useful here. Is he coming to that different? Mm -hmm. he, I think he's going to come to the city council meeting on, I hope, on Thursday to kind of explain more about it next Thursday. OK. That's definitely not how I understood it, but I'll defer to Alan speak yeah. to him. should definitely check with him, because that was my understanding yeah. from the hearing. I can't articulate exactly the legalistic piece of it, but yeah. that was not my understanding that he was kind of pushing back when Carolyn said that. Okay. <coughs> I'm way more confused now than I was <laughs> five minutes. Can I say something about, because I was there, and I think he was pretty clear that because you can only say no if it affects health and safety, that you have to make sure that when you're writing these conditions that you mention the health and safety issues. So that, you know, when you're so bringing up the climate emergency sure. and, you know, whatever, would clearly getting that, that the permit would be denied with because of health and safety issues, he'd be fine with that. He was thinking as it stood, it wasn't clear, you know, that those health and safety conditions were part of it, and that's how we could get sued. But if our regulations say you can't do this because of public health and safety, then that's okay. So this position may be evolving, right? because he definitely told us that things like building a floodplain is health safety, climate change is not health safety. And if he's evolving and accepting that, that's fine, but that's not what we heard originally. I think this does elucidate for us yeah. how yeah. complicated this is <laughs> and how we have the kind of the legal position and then you have the kind of climate change piece of it and then you have the planning department's interest in this and so forth. So that's why there's this request to slow things down. Um, we kept the public hearing open. It's this technicality that you do so that you can continue to examine the issue before you close the public hearing. You have to within, what is it, 30 days? 
there's 60 days, you have to actually make a final right. vote on it. So by keeping the public hearing open, it gives us, we kept it open until April, I can't remember what the date was. Do you remember, Sharon, the 15th or No, I think there were two dates. You, you kept it open to some date, and then the plan Essentially, it was, it was a different two date. months. And, um, and in that time, we have time to do yeah, March research, get answers, but also do a public presentation if, you know, it might be useful to ask folks to come to our next meeting because we'll still, you know, have the time to do it um, if, if this group does want to weigh in. Excuse me. I'm a complete first time everything at this meeting, but I wonder if the tops of the buildings, every building in Northampton, is considered acreage with no trees? So building, yeah, I mean, we, we allow rooftop and parking lots I mean, to have a limited PV. Right. So yeah. we allow all that by right right now. Any any rooftop, any parking lot that's legal is allowed to have it. It's more expensive. So you're not gonna get people doing five megawatt PVs doing that. So a lot of people obviously doing rooftop, but it's a different niche out there. But could we not <coughs> sell our rooftops? Yes, yeah. Yes, we can. Right, and that's um, we can lease them now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. One way to say this is no there's nothing that the city has that would stop you from doing that. That's but it's sort of different market niche. We're trying to right. maximize renewables. You want to do both. Okay. So yes, we like that, and lots of people are doing that. Okay. But it doesn't replace people doing certain renewables out there. Thank you. So all this language specific to PV, or is it other renewable energy systems as well? This is PV. Um, we don't think we really have the wind, so we're not sure. A lot of stuff. I think long term, who knows what? Right. Right. It is definitely PV. Okay, um, so I mean, at least from what, what you just said, it sounds like the Energy Commission, the impression I get is the commission is at least interested in being, made, in being kept in, uh, up to date on this, correct? Yeah. And might be worth it to have it on their agenda next month just in case we want to use it as a way to hold a public forum? I, you know, I think getting your input is great, so I think keeping it on the agenda makes sense. I don't, public forum stuff always worries me. Just like we're, we're playing sort of telephone with what Alan said, and, and right. I, I worry the same thing, because you have multiple public forums that some people say the same thing, some people say different things. So I'd rather leave the other process, the legal process of public forum, but this for your discussion, which would be great. Well, okay. I, I wasn't suggesting a public forum per se, because we have the public hearing process, and we're okay. going to have to continue, we're continuing it, so there will be another public hearing, as it were. I mean, it's the same one, technically, but okay. we'll... Yeah. Um, and that's, so that's being taken care of by the Planning Board and the Legislative Matters Committee. I was just suggesting that if we wanted to really understand it more deeply, in about a month's time, we'll have more research gathered. Okay. And just to have someone come and do a presentation for us, gotcha. and of course, members of the public could gotcha. be here. That's clear. Okay. 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 Any further comments? <coughs> Questions at this moment? Okay. We'll put it on the agenda for next time, too. Um, Right. Okay, Massachusetts, Massachusetts achieving zero energy maze me. Um, as some of you may remember, uh, uh, Darren Park, who presented to us last um, last meeting, uh, had invited me to attend uh, the kickoff meeting for this um, uh, this project that the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership is doing. It's um, it's a project trying to get the state of Massachusetts and its communities to implement zero energy codes and build zero energy schools to propel greater levels of energy savings and greenhouse gas emission reductions for all buildings. Um, their outcomes is that they would like to have an outcome be an adoption of a stretch code that is more efficient than the base code for residential, commercial, and public buildings, commitment and adoption of long-term plan to develop and implement a zero energy code for Massachusetts by 2050. I've also seen their documentation say by 2030 or earlier. Uh, and to have schools demonstrate the feasibility and viability of zero energy buildings to facilitate the direction for other building types. Um, uh, so I attended the first meeting and there was about 30 people there. Um, let's see if I have a second. Yeah, about a third of them were not-for-profits. About a quarter of them were architects. 
Uh, about a quarter of them were state or regional governmental or quasi-governmental type agencies. And then there were two municipalities um, present, Cambridge and Northampton. Um, they're asking if I want to continue to be involved um, as just either you know observer or more active participant. Um, and I'm feeling <coughs> that I'd like to be involved as an active participant. And um, something I experienced at the meeting was that I was the only one that was really speaking from a Western Mass rural community point of view, and that I think I had some valid input from the point of view of being a green community, because green communities have all adopted the stretch code, and if the stretch code gets adopted, the new stretch code is going to affect green communities. So I, I feel like this is kind of gives us a unique, you know, a, a unique perspective to bring to their efforts, and I'm willing to. I, I think I can always say no to a meeting if I don't have time. Um, uh, but I would, so I would bring this back on and, and um, see what folks uh, here thought. Um, if, the, if the Energy Commission doesn't mind being used as a springboard, as a sounding board, um, to bring ideas here and, and bring them back to this effort. And if it turns out this effort's really not going anywhere, I think I can just step back. I think it's a good idea. And NEEP is one of the most influential organizations around energy codes in the region, so be involved in you know, having them running something that you're giving input to is, is a good thing. Okay, yeah. Great, okay. I kind of expected that answer, but I thought it would report back. Um, uh, I will send out the, the notes that they were taken from the meeting. Um, they just came in yesterday or something like that to me, so I can pass that on to people. Um, oh, I will say one more thing just to kind of report back. Um, on the minutes, as you guys noticed, there were Doug's, Doug took minutes last time and filled them out. Uh, and then at the after our discussion last month um, on building codes in general, the stretch code and net zero code, uh, I found that discussion really helpful. And I put together my notes uh, to kind of summarize what I heard the Energy Commission say. And I put them in the minutes. So you guys all approved them. <laughs> I'm assuming you all looked at it and approved them. I have to say, I mean, these ideas I brought to the I brought to that meeting, and I think that this is what I was saying at that meeting. I felt very comfortable saying that because I felt we had a wide community response feeding into it. Um, so I will say, you know, you approve the minutes, but if anybody looks over that and thinks I have something wrong there, let me know because to me this is a little bit of information I'm kind of carrying around my back pocket. Um, uh, is that the summer summary, summary discussion? Yeah, yeah the summary discussion. And what was the one last thing I wanted to say? I'm sorry I missed that meeting. I think it's a really fascinating topic, especially around passive house. Mm -hmm. I haven't read through the notes enough, but that's a huge, I'm working on a proposal for Passos right now, digging into the technical requirements and such, and it's, it's a huge, uh, huge leap yeah. in terms of cost of construction, of course, building performance. And if we're looking at net zero as a goal, I mean, it's so easy to get there without going to Passive House level of performance <coughs> that it's really a different, they are different beasts. <coughs> you know, different, yeah, different approaches. <coughs> Because you can build a basically a little bit better encoded house with proper orientation, good roof, and your net zero. Mm -hmm. But passive yeah. house is you know ten thousand dollars of consultant fees and registrations. And right, right. I think the summation basically said to use pieces of the passive house program. Consider incorporating cost-effective requirements from the passive house program. You know, I don't think the commission. I think that came out in our discussion. Yeah, I saw that. Or just the first note was about. Prioritizing shell efficiency, use of passive energy, and over renewable. Uh, that's a great concept, and the stretch code does that already to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if, if net zero is a goal, I mean, I think renewables have to be a huge part of that. So I think that that's a, the, the problem is right what you said is net zero. Yeah. But the electrical grid operates on a minute by minute basis. And so you, you can be net zero and still be burning a whole lot of oil at night to run your heat pump in a power plant 
because there's no sunshine, again, you don't have any storage. But if demand is very low, then you stay w within whatever storage starts to build up or whatever wind power happens to be developing offshore, um, that you know, it, it becomes more possible to have the economy or at least the buildings portion of the economy running at actual, you know, with actually the building. So we're talking about zero, real zero energy. No, yeah, I'm just saying hour. if you want, if you're concerned about <coughs> actually getting the electrical grid to not use fossil fuels, mm -hmm. you actually have to do things to drive demand really, really low. Well. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would add something kind of on the same line. If you're really going to get to net zero, the most important thing that the city needs to be investing in, and the country needs to be investing in, is battery energy storage systems. The, that is the Achilles heel of uh, the fossil fuel industry. Once you develop grid scale battery energy storage systems, you're going to be able to remove the dependence upon fossil fuels. That anything that you can be doing to drive that is going to be extremely helpful in driving down the cost of, of batteries, uh, especially uh, when it comes to government purchasing. So for school systems, for instance, if you want to make a net zero school, the simplest way to do it is to install large scale battery systems so that when you have intermittent power sources, you can uh, draw off of them when they're not producing. The, the only amendment I have to that is that batteries aren't the only form of storage and electricity isn't the only form of energy storage and energy use that you have. So to the degree that you have thermal energy demand, which is quite large, especially in a lot of existing buildings, if you can store thermal energy, when it's a bit, or store electricity as thermal energy or store thermal energy as thermal energy, whether it's cooling or heating, whichever, say, in a phase change material or thermal mass or whatever you have, that also lowers demand on the grid and lets you use more of those intermittent sources just because that may be the least cost storage for some portion of your demand. Batteries are still expensive. And so you're saying, I want to go back to um, that first bullet point there. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to get and what I thought was the sense of the community, committee here talking about it, is that on-site net zero was, had problems. The fact that, you know, where exactly are you going to locate all these? You're going to have some trees. You don't want to cut down trees for this. Not every site's going to be positioned in the right direction and stuff. Interestingly, at the Mays meeting, Cambridge really brought that up too. Because Cambridge says, well, we don't have enough rooftop to do it. You know, we're, we're, we, have, we have buildings that are tall. We don't have enough rooftop. Um, so what I was trying to get to at this point was the idea that your building code tries to put as much efficiency into the building shell and its, and its structure and its systems as possible. Really drive that down. Kind of leaving the renewable energy part as an aside. You know, you're going to have to go there, but you're, if you're going to build a building, sink your money into the shell and to the systems that will make its energy use as low as possible. And, and that's like a first step towards net zero. Because at some point down the road, we're going to get the renewables or energy storage in place in order to start to supply the renewable power to that house, but you want it to be at a minimum. That's what I was trying to say in that first bullet point. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's the right, yeah, I'm sure that's the right, right process, but yeah. there's a, you know, to go as, make as efficient shell as possible, or passive right. house, right. that's a huge jump and the, the market can't handle that. Right. So where's that fine line? And getting into grid scale batteries storage is awesome, and maybe what we can do at local level or statewide is, like, you know, drive electrification so it's ready for that kind of more regional infrastructure when it's when it's ready. That's what California's thing, right? Their yeah. their codes are driving. So we can do that, but um, it's like so a big difference between you know using what using the tools that we have to make every house as efficient as possible versus let's create the momentum and the structure so that when they happen in a regional uh, grid scale. Yeah, then we're ready for it. Yeah. So, so here's an idea that came to me after this. I actually brought it up there. Is if the stretch code, and right now the stretch code is based on the size of the house, correct? A larger house has to be a uh, lower first rating? Not anymore. Not anymore, but it, did, it was at one time, right? So, I mean, it seems to me, if you're going to build a really large house, you probably have money. 
and you probably have the ability to pay for a tighter house. So if the building code, the no, stretch code, I, I, uh, that's a wrong assumption. That's a wrong assumption. Okay, people will build the biggest house possible because they want more bedrooms, and they'll complain we ask them to spend two hundred dollars more on a better dryer, yeah. right? Like uh -huh. there's people have purchased decisions driven by anything. So that's a big, big assumption. I mean, you can go with it, but okay. Here. Well, the idea was if you, if you had a code in place where, you know, the, the basically the hers rating was lowest for the larger of the house, and that over time the square footage for that lower hers rating got smaller and smaller over time, that would allow, you know, that would give you a glide path towards net zero. So I mean, you'd be starting with large houses. Which are producing the most energy, <coughs> is the most energy use anyhow. But what if the population inside those large houses is also large? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I, I think yeah. you might want to have, I mean, a, a HERS rating is related to an EUI, an energy utilization index, right? So you could come up with something which is like EUI per person. Uh -huh. So you're still, or, or per bedroom plus one, or two, you know, if you want to do it the way Asher does, that's the way you know, but, but do, do something where you're taking into account that you could have a large house with a lot of people, a large house with few people, or you know, you know or, or a, 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 a slum lord's uh, tiny house that they finally they crammed more people in than they're legally allowed to. There's you know, some of those in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and, you know, and so you'd want to try and the problem with those things. And taking account behavior is that it's not asset behavior. You're like you're really getting into no 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 it's not behavior it's bedrooms plus one yeah so that's how it is now but if right you have so for, for density you know for for a number of people and there's there's issues with that well it's 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 bedrooms <coughs> so it's not really a number of people yeah you know it's that's how it is now yeah public. yeah the uh, urgent energy, energy model seems number of bedrooms plus one whether it's people living there are five people right so that, that's I guess that's that's my point is you've got yeah. You, you're you're accounting for the size of the house relative to I don't, I don't know the level of gluttony around, around house size or how you want to think of it. It's too bad you can't base codes off of actual energy use. Right, like a wait a year, and you actually get your your actual CO if you hit these model targets. Or <laughs> yeah, because then you motivate not, people. To, you got to uh, tear into the house and rebuild. <laughs> Right, something in. Cut off the water. Well, but that would encourage you to kind of overperform on the things that are not behavior based. Yeah. So that you have some wiggle room to fail. I like that idea of punitive incentives. <laughs> <laughs> well, energy is a real tight resource, and that's what it comes down to, right? You have you know, people waste. Well, it, in that case, perhaps net zero is <coughs> an interesting problem to think about. So I, I, you may know about this, but this place in East Hampton, I've been kind of consulting long term with Habitat for Humanity on a duplex that they built that was supposed to be net zero. Neither unit has actually achieved net zero. They're doing okay, but their PV is not producing nearly as much as it was supposed to. And the units are using a good deal more than they were supposed to. Um, so that's the other thing. We have this uh, target called net zero, but the models are off. Or, you know, but human behavior is enough of a difference, or perhaps the inverters on the uh, PV are, are bad. You know, like there's all these things. So if that's going to be a goal, but it's just a model goal. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you put that into a code. Since you're not actually performing the way you're Yeah, I'm sure that's true right now. You can even have homes that are got pretty high version rating that have low energy use. If you have people who are willing to close shades and mm -hmm. keep the heat down. <laughs> sure. Yeah. How, how are they defining net zero? Uh, is it simply that all energy is that's utilized is produced by renewable sources? That was, well, at the May's meeting, that was when they went around and started asking everybody their opinion on one topic. That was the first thing that someone came up and said was, how do you define this? Yeah. And it, I think it's an open question right now. Mm -hmm. um, I will say there did seem to be a take on what, however you finally define it, if you call it at zero, 
net zero is a concept that is so much easier for someone to grasp than 20% better or 40% better that there's a, um, you know, there's a real marketing adoption benefit to actually aiming for zero, you know, so, and yet, like you said, how you find it is rather problematic. It's, it's, it's difficult to come up with how you exactly define that zero. But if you're getting anywhere near it, I tell you, it's so much better than what we're doing right now. <laughs> and we're dealing with human behavior. Yeah. God help us. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> she won't. Um, so unless anybody else had more on that, I'm, I'm all set. And I take a motion to adjourn. Unless anybody else has something else? Second. Okay. All in favor?